And good afternoon again to Warrington UQA Photo Group. It's a pleasure to be back again. So, yes, as you can see from the si subtitle, I'm talking about astrophotography, what you can do in terms of photographing the sky, but without ridiculously expensive equipment. I will mention some ridiculously expensive equipment, but then I'm going to show you some images that you can take using, hopefully, the camera you've already got. That's the idea. So I'll be saying what you can do with essentially nothing other than the camera you already own and perhaps a tripod. Then I'll be looking at, uh, briefly, the idea of telescopes and mounts that mount those telescopes, but I won't be dwelling on that for too long because what I want to talk about is cameras and, if you want to take pictures of the night sky, the idea of a small, relatively modestly priced tracker that will allow you to take pictures that I'm going to show you. So the photo gallery will be essentially, here's the sort of pictures you can take with the camera you've already got and a simple little sky tracker. And then I'll be saying something at the end about how you can take pictures if you ever are lucky enough to go to the dark skies of uh, somewhere like Africa. So firstly, what can you do in terms of starting simple? Well, as some of, you, some of you, I'm sure, are already aware, the simplest thing you can do is simply put a camera on a tripod, point it at the sky, and open the shutter for a few minutes. This was taken before I got into digital photography. This was quite a few years old. I don't remember exactly which year this was. Uh, I think it was about 20 years ago um, with slide film. I went on holiday to Egypt, went over the border into Jordan, and had the opportunity to simply put the camera on a tripod, point it north, take a five-minute exposure or something like that. So this was a, a wide-angle lens, and we can see that we're looking north because there's the North Pole, there's Polaris that hardly appears to be moving at all. And as you go further from Polaris, you can see the stars have moved because the entire sky appears to have moved a small fraction of one rotation. So roughly speaking, you can actually work out what the exposure was simply by looking at how far the stars have moved as a fraction of 24 hours. That's how I determined this was a five-minute exposure. Of course, we didn't have EXIF data imprinted onto our slides and color prints back then. Uh, we had to rely on memory or writing it down. So that's the simplest thing you can do, but of course you need to have a reasonably dark sky if you want to take a long exposure. This doesn't work so well if you're under very light polluted skies, but as long as you can get somewhere dark and find yourself somewhere out in the open, you can always take star trails. You're not limited by a few minutes. There's no reason now with digital photography that you don't take much longer star trails. So this was six hours, but not, you'll be surprised to know, a one six-hour exposure. It was simply taken as a large number of one-minute exposures. And of course, once you've got all that information digitally, it's relatively easy to throw that at a piece of software. You can get this software for free. Uh, which will basically add up all of those images for you and generate the entire exposure as if you had taken a full six-hour exposure. Again, you can tell it's six hours because the stars seem to have moved approximately one quarter of a rotation. Notice also that Polaris here at the centre is not, strictly speaking, not moving because the Earth's axis doesn't point directly at Polaris. Polaris is simply conveniently close. It's a little less than one degree away from the North Pole. In this particular case, these images were taken. It looks like it's in a blue sky. It almost looks like it was taken in daylight when you look at this sort of image. The sky is blue and the grass is sort of green because this was taken during a full moon. And hence, the sky was not purely black and the full moon was illuminating the foreground grass and shrubbery and it was illuminating the white domes here taken uh, at Tenerife Observatory, the tidy observatory on the volcano in... Uh, Tenerife. So we take our astrophysics students from the University of Liverpool and Liverpool John Moores University, we take students out to Tenerife uh, for a field trip so that they know what genuine dark skies look like. But even in Tenerife, they still have the full moon occasionally, and therefore you can't always get the skies that you would like. But software will allow you not only to add up, for instance, a large number of one-minute exposures, it can also allow you to add them up and make a movie out of it so you can, as it were, see the sky rotate. You can make a movie in which the stars move or you can make a movie in which the stars trail. 
Again, free software will allow you, if you start with a whole load of individual images, you can add them together in various ways to get the results you want, a star trail or a star movie. So that's by far the easiest thing to do, simply because all it requires is your camera, a reasonably wide-angle lens, usually a tripod, and it helps to have a little intervalometer. Many cameras already have that functionality. If you can find them in the menu, take me one exposure every minute for the next six hours. Even if the camera doesn't allow you to do that, a simple little intervalometer which plugs into the camera will allow you to set it, and you can basically just set it and let it run for a few hours if your battery lasts that long. Under the category of uh, there are plenty of things you can photograph in the sky, but in a sense you have to be lucky that they are around. Comets come around every once in a while, but of course you can't really predict them. Uh, basically comets are like cats, they have tails and they're unpredictable. So you can't tell when they're coming, but every once in a while a comet will come through the solar system and occasionally it makes a good target for astrophotography. In this particular case, the exposure was 30 seconds, and it didn't really need the camera to follow the sky, because in 30 seconds, the stars might have apparently moved slightly if you're taking a fixed image of a camera on a tripod, but it doesn't show too badly, and in this particular case, the coma, the, the sort of the head of the comet, has expanded sufficiently that even with a relatively modest focal length, 300 millimeters here, the comet fills a reasonably nice part of the field of view. So again, a camera on a static tripod, basically the cheapest way of doing any astrophotography. But definitely falling into the, you have to be in the right place at the right time, is Aurora. So in this particular case, again, we're flipping back here to uh, a couple of decades ago, 2002, I think this was, um, with uh, Fujichrome slide film. Here, a visit to Iceland. And again, if people visit Scandinavia or Iceland or Alaska or any of the northern states, there's a pretty good chance you'll see the northern lights. As seen from England, you tend to only see the very top of an auroral display peeking over the northern horizon. If you go to somewhere closer to the Arctic Circle, the entire sky lights up green and red. And so you have no difficulty in photographing the aurora. The only catch is that with film rather than digital cameras, the exposures had to be relatively long because of the relative insensitivity of film, and so some of the rather interesting shimmering effects of the aurora are lost because a long exposure simply blurs that all out. I would like one day to go back to Iceland with a digital camera and take much shorter exposures which can capture some of this interesting detail which gets washed out if you take an exposure of a few minutes. So you get uh, some of the detail of the curtains, but a lot of the detail is not there because of the long exposures. Again, this was a wide-angle lens, 24 millimeter lens. Those of you who know your way around the sky might recognize the constellation of Orion on the left-hand side there, and the little seven sisters, the Pleiades star cluster, right in the middle there. And definitely another example of you can only do this if you're in the right place at the right time is a total eclipse of the sun. You don't need any special equipment. The camera you've already got, a reasonable telephoto lens. It doesn't have to be a particularly long focal length. Stick it on a tripod and snap away. But of course, you have to be in the shadow of the moon, so you have to look at the eclipse predictions and say, right, where's the shadow of the moon going to be for the next eclipse? There's one coming up this year. Um, striping its way across America, if anybody wants to try this. Um, if you stand in the right place and wait, then the moon will co cover the sun, and then you get this beautiful solar corona, the outer atmosphere of the sun, showing up. It's very bright on the inside edge and much fainter on the outside edge, so usually a single exposure doesn't capture all of the detail that's in the solar corona. So the exposures you notice down here, it says various exposures because I took, I took essentially every exposure I could from one four thousandth of a second all the way up to four seconds and every exposure <coughs> excuse me, in between and then added them all together. Again, software allows you to do this so that the enormous brightness range from the inner corona to the outer corona gets composited into a reasonably nice image. So this, again, was 2006. This was uh, one of my early uh, ventures into digital photography. 
So you can do a lot with a tripod as long as the right object is there. Star trails from anywhere as long as you've got a clear sky. Eclipses, aurora, you have to be lucky to get the right subject to catch those. If you wanted to get into astrophotography using a telescope, well, there's lots of options available to you. There's a rather old telescope. It's more than 30 years old now. Um, it'll be retiring before too long, so watch out on eBay, because eventually it'll be possible to get it second-hand as long as you make an offer somewhere north of about a billion dollars or so. So it's not really feasible. You can, if you wish, have a look at Hubble images, of course, but that's not most, what most of us consider photography to be. In other words, going out and looking at somebody else's pictures is not really what it's all about. So using the Hubble Space Telescope is not an option for most of us. It would produce fantastic images if you had access to it, but you can always download those, of course, from the web if that's what you really want to do. Alternatively, a 747 with a telescope in the back. Again, this particular observatory called the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, SOFIA, uh, this has been operational for quite a few years but has retired a few months ago. So again, watch out on eBay. If you see 747, one careful owner, you know it's that one. It's got a telescope in the back which could produce some wonderful images. It was flown in the back of a 747 simply because that means you can get a, above a lot of the Earth's atmosphere. Not all of it. Hubble gets effectively above most of the Earth's atmosphere. This 747 gets above 90-something percent of the Earth's atmosphere and so allows you a better view of the rest of the universe. If you want to do astrophotography but don't want to buy the equipment for yourself, there are other options. You can effectively hire instruments or, basically, uh, there are some that are designed for use by um, either researchers, which have a sum of the time, or uh, for educational purposes, uh, schools and others can basically ask for time on the instrument. The Liverpool telescope, sitting on the Palmer, is currently the world's largest robotic telescope, but there are other robot telescopes around the world where you can either ask for or pay for, and paying usually requires a few tens of pounds to have an hour or two on a remote instrument, whether it be in Australia or in Chile or in the Canary Islands, in which you can basically use it as if it was yours for an hour or two and set it up to take a picture of your favorite object. So to do astrophotography, you don't have to buy the expensive equipment for yourself. You don't have to buy an expensive telescope. You don't need an expensive astronomical camera. You can basically just rent somebody else's. And you can get some wonderful images of all sorts of objects around the universe by doing that. If you wanted to buy yourself a telescope, well, a few hundred or a few thousand or a few tens of thousands of pounds will buy you an astronomical telescope. It's a bit of a minefield, because trying to decide, is this telescope for a few hundred pounds what I want, or should I be investing more money for a much better, technically better telescope, perhaps with a better optical performance? How much money should you be thinking of paying for the sort of instrument that you might want to take pictures of the night sky with? Well, the bottom line is it's very difficult to tell. It depends on what objects you want to photograph, how good the skies are, how much sky you can actually see from your back garden. So there's a lot of factors that need to be taken into account. There are various telescopes which are quite popular with amateurs. Some amateurs are quite happy with 500 pounds worth of equipment. Some amateurs will gladly spend a thousand pounds or two on the telescope that hopefully will keep them in their astronomical hobby for the next 10 or 20 years, perhaps. So it's a rather large investment, but if you spread it over 20 years, then it's by no means a large amount of money per year. Some people like to take an instrument like the one on the left and turn it into spaghetti by buying themselves a dedicated astronomical camera and then bolting lots of extras on and trying to win the competition of putting as many cables onto an instrument as possible to turn it into tech spaghetti, basically. A lot of people will argue, well, Optical performance of the telescope is important if you're trying to see small objects or faint objects or very remote objects in the night sky. But if you're trying to photograph them, what is really important is that you have a nice stable mount onto which the telescope can be put. 
because if you want to, because of the Earth turning, follow the sky, it's a bit of annoyance, but okay, the Earth turns once a day, we can't do much about that. The best we can do is to buy ourselves a mount which turns at once a day in the opposite sense, so that as far as the telescope is concerned, it seems to be static and pointing at the object that we're interested in, regardless of the Earth turning underneath us. And if you want to do that as precisely as possible, so you can use the longest possible focal length of either lens or telescope, and you want to do that with precision to get the longest possible exposures, then you need the most precisely engineered mount that you can afford. But unfortunately, they do start to get very expensive. A very small mount for holding a telescope, if it costs only a hundred pounds, it's probably a little bit like jelly. If you happen to cough when you're within 10 meters of it, it'll shake and your images will become blurred. If you want the sort of mount that professionals say is the sort of one that you really want, if you want to take superb images of the night sky, well, you might have to pay $10,000 just for the mount. This is before you've thought about the optics of the telescope and the camera that you want to use for your astrophotography. Some amateurs will pay $10,000 for a mount because they say astrophotography is what I want to do and I'm prepared to pay that amount of money to do it. I would argue that's a little over the top. It's certainly over the top for 99% of astronomers and photographers that I know. If anybody is actually interested in, I'm thinking of buying a telescope because I want to do astrophotography and I want to see these objects in the universe and I want to be able to photograph them, I've got a different talk on how you go about choosing a telescope that might be suitable for astronomy. So I can point you to a recording of that if you're interested. What do you do in terms of if you do decide to buy a telescope because you want to do astrophotography, what do you do with it? Well, you put it in an observatory. It would be nice to have a back garden that looks like that so that you have large enough space in which you can put the, uh, the observatory. That's the observatory of the five-meter telescope, the Hale telescope, built in the middle of the last century. I visited that a long time ago and thought, whoa, when I grow up, I'm going to have a back garden big enough to have an observatory like that in. Um, I visited it back in 1982. Oh, it looks like I'm actually wearing the same shirt. Uh, yeah, okay, maybe not. Uh, but I certainly had longer hair back in those days. That was when I was a PhD student. And visiting this large observatory, I thought, that's fantastic. That, I want one of those. Uh, when I eventually had a house with a back garden in which I could build an observatory, I had to downscale my idea slightly. Uh, and I ended up with a B&Q shed, which I converted by putting a sort of a, a cover over the top and folding panels, so this waterproof uh, cover came off, the panels opened up and allowed me to see the night sky. Inside you can see what it looked like before I let all the spiders come in. Uh, you can tell it's a very old picture, not from the telescope itself, but from the uh, laptop behind it, which looks more like a brick than it does the sort of slender sliver of a laptop that we see today. But basically, that was my version of an observatory that I've had for quite a few years. Don't use it so much recently, mainly because the trees outside my garden have grown so high, I don't see as much sky as I used to. But I did use it for a while to observe the moon, and I thought I'd photograph the moon, and I photographed a couple of planets. And even the moon, don't overlook the moon. We see lots of pictures at the back there showing how wonderful the moon can be. Just because it's our nearest neighbor doesn't mean you can say, well, I want to do astronomy, I want to see distant galaxies. The fact that it's only a quarter of a million miles away, it's still fascinating to use a telescope to get a little bit of magnification on some of these craters and some of these mountain ranges and see how the shadows change from night to night. You can effectively watch, if you wish, the sad shadows changing from hour to hour as the moon slowly goes around the sun, uh, no, the moon slowly goes around the earth. It takes a month to go around the earth. In a few hours, the angle between the moon and the sun will change a little bit and the shadows that the mountains cast will change. And if you wish, as we've seen at the back there, you can take photographs of various moon phases. It has the advantage, it's a nice bright object. Let's move on from telescopes and mounts, which can be very expensive. Even a cheap telescope and mount can cost at least hundreds and probably thousands of pounds. Let's think about how you can do astrophotography without spending quite so much money. Let's just remind ourselves about the basics. Maybe this is not really necessary for a photo group, but I'll just remind you that in the days of uh, film, 
the idea of photography was you would use not a single lens, but usually a collection of lens elements to focus light onto either black and white film. Um, these days, of course, it might be a CCD chip. How do we actually get color imaging from something that is sensitive to light, like a CCD chip or uh, the, uh, the silver halide of a film emulsion? How do we get color information? Well, one possibility is simply to put colored filters in front and take three images. That's how it was done in the very early days. You would use black and white film. You would take a red, then a green, then a blue filter to get three images and then combine them into a color image. But then along came color film in which the filters were actually embedded into the emulsion themselves very cleverly, such that you ended up with layers within the emulsion that gave you effectively the red and the green and the blue information about what light was coming in. With a CCD chip, with mod modern digital photography, the CCD chip is and always will be a monochromatic. It will always be a black and white detector. So the color filtering has to come before the chip itself. And so they do that by putting colored filters on the surface of the chip. If we look in detail at what's going on, most chips, not all, but most, will have a particular pattern of red, green, and blue filters called a Bayer grid. It won't always look like this, but 90-odd percent of camera manufacturers use this system. If you count them up, you notice there's twice as many green filters as there are red and blue. That mirrors the way our eyes are more sensitive to the green part of the spectrum than the red and blue end of the spectrum. But when you take a color image using a color camera, you end up with this information. If we, if we separate out the red pixels, the green pixels, and the blue pixels, and then that information is interpolated and rebuilt by the computer that's sitting inside the camera to generate a color image, which then gets saved either as a raw image or as a uh, JPEG image. If we want to do astrophotography, we could say, well, let's buy ourselves a little astro camera. Let's buy ourselves a, the sort of camera that can replace an eyepiece. So we've got a telescope, we've got an eyepiece. We could replace the eyepiece with a small camera. Sometimes they're called electronic eyepieces for that reason. And so, for instance, a relatively modest number of pixels, let's say two megapixels, a color camera would cost about 250 pounds. If you went up to larger resolutions, the sort of resolutions that you're perhaps more used to in your, uh, your digital SLR or your bridge or your mirrorless cameras, if we went up a little bit further towards that, if we went up to seven megapixels of color camera, that might cost us 2,000 pounds if it's dedicated as an astro camera. You may be surprised to know that if you went to a seven megapixel mono camera, it costs pretty much the same. As far as the manufacturer is concerned, the cost of adding that color grid, the Bayer grid, the colored filters, the cost of making a CCD and then adding the color filters on top, the color filter makes almost no difference. So most manufacturers will actually sell a mono camera or a color camera pretty much at the same price. Maybe a slight difference, but perhaps only a few percent difference. So it's up to you to decide whether or not you want to generate color images or whether you want to generate mono images. There is no actual price difference between the two. But if you buy yourself a mono camera and decide, I want to take color images because the mono camera hasn't got the filters built in on top of the chip, then you'll have to add the filters yourself. And that's usually done with a filter wheel a wheel which is either manually or computer controlled to rotate a given filter into the front of the, uh, in the line, in the optical line in front of the chip, such that you can then put a red or a green or a blue filter in front of the camera. Or you don't have to stick to that. You can have filters that show you where the hydrogen is, filters that let through a particular wavelength that corresponds to the glowing light from hydrogen, or a filter that shows you oxygen, or a filter that shows you sulfur. So you can either take color images by just putting in red, green, blue, or you can choose to have particular filters that show you what particular elements are out there in the universe. The catch is this will cost you money. Filter wheels cost hundreds of pounds. Filters might cost hundreds of pounds. So if you're going to buy a, color, a mono camera and then add color capability, the price starts really, really ratcheting up. And I would argue that, well, although these can produce superb images, 
if you spend the money, if you've got the time and the effort to make sure you use them correctly, you can get wonderful images from these cameras. But you've probably already got a camera, so why not use the camera you've already got? So I'm taking an example of a digital SLR simply because that's what I've got. It would be equally valid if you were talking about a bridge camera or a mirrorless camera, perhaps not so much a little compact camera, and not so much whatever's in your iPhone, but if you've got a reasonable camera with a reasonable sized chip, then why not use that for astrophotography rather than buy one of these dedicated cameras, which is great for astrophotography, and nothing else, because they are great for astrophotography, but that's all they can do. Your digital SLR, of course, is good for daylight photography, but lo and behold, they're also good for astrophotography. So, if you've already got a camera, why not try a star tracker? What do I mean by a star tracker? A tracker is just something that will turn the camera at one revolution a day. We're sitting on a rotating Earth, which is rotating at one revolution a day, hence the sky appears to move at the rate of one revolution per day. If you can mount the camera not on a tripod, but on a box that moves at the same rate and make sure that it's moving in the opposite sense to the Earth, then hopefully the camera will then stay static relative to the object you're trying to photograph. So I built myself a little tracker. It looks a little bit odd. It's a couple of bits of aluminium with a hinge at the back and a motor here simply opens up the hinge and one moves relative to the other. So if the bottom piece is fixed to a tripod, the top piece will rotate at the rate if you get the uh, motor right and if you get the gearing right, the motor will turn that top arm at the rate of one revolution per day. It will counteract the rotation of the Earth. So this particular tracker I built with bits of aluminium. It cost me about 25 quid or so. Um, if anybody's interested, I can show you the instructions. I can make them available to you as a PDF so that you can build yourself a star tracker for about 25 quid. I used it for about six or seven years or so and then decided to change to a different tracker. I went and uh, bought one which has a few advantages over my design. The main advantage is this one runs almost forever in the sense that it'll run all night, uh, whereas mine will only run for a limited amount of time before the two arms are too far apart, and then it has to be reset, and then it's run again, and then reset. So mine will work fine as long as you're around to keep resetting it every 20 minutes. This one you can just set up and run and leave for as long as the batteries last, which is usually about 24 hours or 36 hours or thereabouts. Basically, it's a motor in a box. It's a motor in a box, and the camera gets attached to this uh, uh, either one quarter or three eighths bush at the top there. And on the side, we've got a tiny little telescope, a so-called polar scope, to make sure that this particular box is lined up with the Earth's axis. If the Earth is turning one way, we want to make sure the box turns the other way, and the two axes, the Earth's axis and the box axis, we want to make sure they're lined up. So we have a little polar scope there, which we line up with Polaris. So the idea is you put the box on a tripod, and you connect your camera, perhaps with a ball and socket joint, perhaps with something else, on the other side there. And you can gauge the size of this from the size of the cameras. It's a little bit smaller than a camera. It weighs probably less than a kilogram. It's a very compact thing to stick in your luggage if you're going on holiday to somewhere with dark skies. Putting one of these little trackers in your luggage doesn't really use much of your allocation. So it's uh, it they're capable of taking quite a few kilograms. Here I've got my Nikon DSLR with a 300 millimeter lens sitting on this particular tracker. One point is the one I said earlier that I think it's expensive to buy astronomical cameras mainly because they're only good for astronomy rather than anything else. The camera and lens that I use for astrophotography are precisely the same ones that I've used for the images that I showed you a year ago. When I go on safari and take pictures of animals, this picture of a lion was taken a few months ago when I went on safari again. That was taken with this camera and with this lens. And the images I'm going to show you shortly of astrophotography are taken with that camera and with that lens. They are not modified, adapted, or specialized in any way for astrophotography. They are the lenses I bought anyway to do other things. I just reused them in the astronomical sense.
just for your information, that's what's in a tracker. It's relatively simple. Batteries, a little bit of circuitry, a motor with a gearbox, because of course we're taking a motor which is spinning quite fast and we want to slow it down to one revolution in 24 hours. So you need a lot of gearing, hence the wheel, and this gear wheel will then turn at one revolution in 24 hours. Strictly speaking, not one in 24 hours. The Earth actually turns one rotation in 23 hours, 56 minutes. That has to be taken into account in these trackers to make sure they're tracking at the right speed. But that's effectively what's inside the box. So let me show you what you can do with uh, a camera and a tracker. So this is just a, a sort of a, a little overview. I have seen people take superb images with a telescope with a telescope, possibly a large telescope, on a very solid mount, maybe in an observatory in their back garden, you can get some fantastic images. But my point this afternoon is you don't have to. These images that I'm showing you here of galaxies or nebulae or the Milky Way or a star that's blown itself to pieces in a supernova, these images can be taken with your camera. So, yes, it can be very rewarding to do it the expensive way. But it will take time. It will take effort, and it will take cash if you want to do astrophotography through a telescope. So even if you're thinking of doing that, I would argue it's better to start by doing some astrophotography either on a tripod or with a tracker and then see what sort of images you get. And if you're not happy with those, then you can say, right, I am going to invest in a telescope and do some astrophotography, but be prepared. Not only is it going to cost money, it will take time, it will take effort before you get the sort of quality of images that you sometimes see in astronomical magazines, for instance. Bear in mind that if you take a picture of the night sky and look at what's going on on the back of the camera, what you tend to see is something that looks a little bit like that. That was taken in the light polluted skies of suburbia, um, somewhere around Birmingham, I think that was. And so if you take a picture of the night sky, the raw image that you get might look horrible. You might be hoping for a superb image, but what you get at first sight looks terrible because you have pollution from possibly sodium street lights, possibly other street lights not so far away. Maybe you live um, close to a city, maybe you live further out, but there's still a town on the horizon lighting up part of your sky. So at first sight, it can be disappointing. But it's amazing how good software is. And again, you can get free software or you can pay for software that allows you to take a series of images taken that look a little bit like that, and they can be processed such that the sky can be effectively darkened and the thing of interest, in this case this nebula, which is glowing mainly pink with a little bit of blue in it, the colours are real colours because this is a nebula that's glowing because of the hydrogen and oxygen content of this particular nebula and hydrogen glows in the pink or the red end of the spectrum and oxygen glows in the sort of bluey green part of the spectrum. So these are the genuine colours of the nebula that you could just about make out here and perhaps you can also see why this particular nebula is called the North America Nebula because of the outline of this particular cloud. So software can do an awful lot to mitigate the effect of moderate levels of light pollution. If you live in a really bad area, like the middle of a city, then you might find that even software can't cope and you have to think about using filters to actually get rid of some of the light pollution. And again, if any of you are interested in doing astrophotography but you live in a very light polluted area, I can give you some information later or offline about how you can mitigate with filters some light pollution problems. But here's a picture taken with uh, the lens, uh, the, the body that I'm using at the moment, a Nikon D7500, and my lens of choice, which is a 300 millimeter lens, which is something that I usually refer to as my safari lens, because that is the lens I take on safari, that's the lens that took the picture of the lion, etc. And here I've taken, as usual, a large number of short exposures, there's very little point in taking really long exposures. If you take a series of short exposures and add them up, you get essentially the same result. 
But taking lots of short exposures means if something goes wrong, if a plane goes across your field of view, if some clouds come across for a while when you're taking lots of images, you can just throw those images away, not include the clouds, not include the one that had a plane going across, not include the one that had a few satellites going across, and then you can add up, stack, as it's called in, in astrophotography, stack all of the images that you're left with that look to be good, and then you're looking at an image which is about as good as taking a much longer exposure, but of course a much longer exposure could easily be spoiled by passing cloud or passing aircraft or other things. So this is a star-forming region in the constellation of Monoceros, the unicorn, and so there are stars being born in the middle of this hydrogen cloud. Again, we can tell it's hydrogen because it looks a little bit pinky. We sometimes have to be a bit careful when we're processing astro images to make sure that we don't distort the colors too much. Some people like to deliberately change the colors in order to bring out certain details in the image. I prefer to keep the image as close to natural color as possible. So that looks possibly even worse. This is a different nebula. This is a star that's come to the end of its life and it shrugged off the outer layers of its atmosphere to produce this shell of gas that's now floating into the region in between stars, the so-called interstellar medium. And it's a little bit blue and a little bit pink, again, because of the elements that exist there. And I'm showing this one. It's quite an old one that, again, I took about 20 or so years ago. With, a, with my first digital camera, I think that was, the Nikon D70. I'm showing that simply to remind you that you can get images which look not as good as the Hubble Space Telescope. That's the Hubble Space Telescope image of the same object. So here, my stars are a little bit bloated because with a finite-sized set of optics, you can't get the stars absolutely pinpoint. The Hubble Space Telescope is sitting above the Earth's atmosphere, so the stars are about as crisp as they can possibly be. And the Hubble shows more detail in this planetary nebula. It's called planetary. It's nothing to do with planets. It's just what's the name of a star that's blown off the outer layers because when they were first seen centuries ago, they looked like disks and people mistook them for planets. But these so-called planetary nebula can be imaged by the Hubble and can be imaged by you with a relatively modest focal length. Now, I'm not claiming it's anywhere near as good as the Hubble, but that basically was the camera and lens I had anyway on top of a, a few pounds worth or maybe a few tens of pounds worth of tracker, whereas that cost $10 billion. So it's up to you as to whether you say, I'm only interested in getting images as good as the Hubble, or I want to photograph things that Hubble has photographed. They're not going to be as good, but I can take them with my equipment. This was taken when I was on safari, so this is not visible from the United Kingdom. It's a, a nebula. Again, it's relatively pink, which means it's mainly full of hydrogen. This is a nebula in the southern hemisphere called uh, Eta Carina. In this particular case, it's a relatively large nebula in the sky. Notice that it's only an 85 millimeter lens. I didn't even need a telephoto lens to capture this particular object. It's so large in the night sky that you only need something like a portrait lens. It's barely any bigger than a standard lens in order to capture detail in this particular part of the sky. So don't assume that if you want to take pictures in the night sky, you necessarily need a 300 millimeter lens or a 500 millimeter lens. Nope. In some cases, wide angle or standard or relatively modest focal lengths like 85 millimeter are enough to give you very interesting looking images. This particular object is visible from the northern hemisphere in the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. This is a star that went bang a long time ago. Many thousands of years ago, this star exploded in a supernova. So the star was somewhere in there. It's probably not visible anymore. And it produced a spherical shell of gas, which has been expanding ever since. And just like a soap bubble, when you think of a soap bubble, you tend to see reflections on one side or the other. You don't necessarily see a complete soap bubble. This is probably an entire sphere of gas but it just so happens we're looking at the sphere edge on in these particular parts and we can't really see the bit of the sphere that's coming towards us or away from us. So again, the colors are relevant. This has a little bit of hydrogen in it, but there appears to be a lot of oxygen 
in this particular star, when it went bang, it produced a lot of elements which got dispersed into the interstellar medium, but it looks like hydrogen and oxygen appear to be the, uh, the biggest components of this particular system. Why does that thing hide that? Yes, good question. So this particular image was taken with a filter because this was taken in a light polluted area. So the previous image was taken when I was on safari in Africa, no light pollution whatsoever. But this was taken from outside my front door, probably about 10 meters away from the street light. There was a huge amount of light pollution. I tried to make sure not too much of that light was going into the lens itself, but I used a filter which effectively cut out most, if not all, of the light pollution from the street light. The street light in question was an LED street light, which means it's emitting over the entire visible spectrum. Whereas I was interested in this particular supernova remnant, which is emitting mainly hydrogen and oxygen light, which means mainly in a very narrow part of the red end of the spectrum and a relatively narrow part of the blue-green of the spectrum. Most of the rest of the spectrum I wasn't interested in because that's not where this nebula is emitting. So I used a tri-band filter which let through, as it happens, three wavelengths of light which would let through the hydrogen and the oxygen light and would essentially kill all of the light pollution from the LED street light. So even though that is in a light polluted area, you can still take pictures in which the sky looks nice and dark not necessarily black, but certainly nice and dark, and you can see features which would otherwise be lost in the pollution of the sky that you get whenever you have street lights around. So a tri-band filter is something that you can consider if you live in light polluted areas. You don't need it if you can get to dark skies, if you can get away from street lights, if you can go to other countries in which there's no light pollution around, you certainly don't need filters. If any of you live close to streetlights where you think that's going to be problematic, again, I can tell you about the different types of filters that are available to use. And I have a, a leaflet here I can hand out to people if you're interested. A 135 millimeter, again, you don't need always 30, uh, 300 millimeter lens. This particular cloud in the sky, it's in the constellation of Scorpius. It's large enough that you don't need a very long focal length. I found a 135 millimeter lens was all I needed to catch this particular very colorful part of the sky. It's colorful because there's a bright star here lighting up this part of the nebula in this characteristic yellow. There's a blue star here which is lighting up that part of the nebula as blue. There's a little bit of pink down here, implying there's a little bit of hydrogen sitting down there. And there are some parts of this nebula which are so dense, they are coming out relatively dark and blocking the light from stars behind them. So you get dark nebula and yellow nebula and blue nebula and pink nebula. These colors are real in the sense that I have not deliberately colored them. They may not be perfect in the sense I can't guarantee that is exactly the right shade of yellow or orange, but they are as close to natural colors as I could get with the images that I took. In this case, I took slightly longer images of two minutes each and added up 60 of them to give me the equivalent of a two-hour exposure to try and pick up as much detail in this region as possible. And for those of you who are interested, the James Webb Space Telescope on its first birthday, one year after it started producing science data, uh, actually produced an image of uh, a, little, a little region of that uh, nebula uh, to, to celebrate its one year of operation. The James Webb Space Telescope, of course, does not see the sort of field of view that you see with amateur astrophotography. Space telescopes like the Hubble and the James Webb Space Telescope have tiny fields of view. And so the wonderful images that you see reported on the, on the uh, I was about to say on the web, but let's make it clear, on the World Wide Web, the images that you see or the images that you see in magazines will be tiny compared to the sort of images that you can obtain with astrophotography on amateur instruments. So... That 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me just think. Um, that particular star-forming region is about 400 light years away, and we've taken it with a 135 millimeter lens, which has a field of view of about that much. So if it's 400 light years away, that is probably many tens of light years across. Yep. So remember, the distance between us and the nearest star is about four light years. So these clouds of gas are much bigger than typical distances between stars. So it's difficult to tell because, of course, there's so many stars in the image and you can't tell what the star distances are. But yes, this might be 100 light years across, something like that. Vast and relatively low density. It looks like it's absolutely chock full of stuff. But actually, if you look at the density of gas, it's actually what we would call a vacuum. If you had that same stuff in this room, you would hardly notice that there was hydrogen and oxygen and other atoms floating around. It only looks like a chaotic mess because we're looking at 100 light years of it and it's very deep. The actual density of these things are relatively low. But yes, I, I appreciate that it's difficult to judge the size of something like that. But let's say at least tens and probably 100 light years or so across. The only thing I do remember is that this particular region in which stars are forming is about 400 light years away. So that means, of course, that we're looking at it as it was 400 years ago, because light has taken 400 years to reach us to form that particular image. So that's the brightest star in the constellation of Scorpius, Antares. That's the one that's lighting up the yellow. There's actually a, a star cluster in there, and that star is lighting up the blue part of that particular uh, region. And there's a lot of other dark clouds in there, which is why it's called a cloud complex, because this particular region of sky has got so much going on in there. That's one of the reasons it's a popular target with amateurs. There's a lot going on, and there's some nice colors in there. But we are not restricted to looking at what's going on within our own galaxy. If we want to, we can look at other galaxies. Admittedly, not that many of them. Because most galaxies are so far away, we can't possibly catch them with amateur equipment. Hubble and the James Webb Space Telescopes have no problem looking at thousands of galaxies that are out there. This is our largest immediate neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy. And if you're interested, it's about two and a half million light years away. And it's about the same size as the Milky Way. This object is about 100,000 light years across. So we're looking at this object as it was two million years ago, two and a half million years ago, because that's how long light has taken to reach us. This, again, 300 millimeter, my lens of choice for these sorts of things. Again, a series of short exposures, 30 exposures of one minute each. So this is the equivalent of a half hour exposure. You can see the structure of the galaxy. You can see some dark dust lanes. You can pick out the spiral nature of this particular galaxy. It also appears to have two little companions, much like our own galaxy has two little companions that we can see in the southern hemisphere. There are two little satellite galaxies that are probably just buzzing around it. But we can't get many galaxies with that much detail because there aren't that many galaxies that are only two million light years away. A lot of galaxies are much further than that, and so we struggle to get an awful lot of detail from anything further away. But in 2020, when a certain pandemic hit, we had a lockdown, and we were stuck inside for a while. And I remember Stephen Hawking saying, remember, look up at the stars, not down at your feet. But we were told, stay two meters away from everybody, and there were little feet on the pavement, and we're told to watch out and keep our distance. Hawking said, look up at the stars, not down at your feet. So I thought, during this pandemic lockdown, I wonder how far I can see. I wonder how far my camera can capture information. I'm not going to go to my telescope in the back garden. I'm going to take my camera and my lens of choice, and I'm going to ask the question, what's the furthest object I can catch with this particular combination? So I put my, lens, uh, my camera and 300mm lens on my trusty little star tracker, went outside my front door, and took the longest exposure I could get away with in July. Remember, we don't have much night in July. Between evening dusk and morning dawn, between those two twilights, you only get two to three hours of relative darkness. So I took as many exposures as I could 
after it got dark before it started to get light again. I ended up with about 256 exposures of 30 seconds each. That's a little over two hours. What I wanted to do was to catch a particular galaxy. I had looked up where are the most distant galaxies which might be bright enough that I have a chance of catching them in my camera and lens. I looked up a catalogue and found that there was one visible from the Northern Hemisphere, from the United Kingdom. This particular galaxy is almost overhead. That's about as good as you can get. I didn't want it low down on the horizon, lost in the murk. I didn't want it to be behind a streetlight. I wanted it to be as high as possible. And I found a galaxy that was high in the sky in July, so I pointed my camera at that particular point. That is a bright star, which happens to be in roughly the same line of sight as the distant galaxy that I was after. That was an advantage because it means that I could simply look through my camera, find that star, focus on it, make sure everything was set up, and then take a long exposure, hoping that the galaxy itself, which is just next door to that star, might be visible. So I took the camera in that particular configuration, that I think was taken on the day that I actually took this image, took it outside, took this long two-hour exposure. Then I looked inside that square because that that's where I expected this particular galaxy to be. This particular galaxy is called a quasar. A quasar is just the name of a galaxy which has a very bright nucleus. There's a really big black hole at the center of this galaxy which is emitting an enormous amount of radiation and hence can be seen even at great distances. So this particular quasar I expected to be at the center of the square. So I blew up the center of the square, and that is it. The most unspectacular picture you will ever see. It is essentially, if we blow it up any further, it's essentially one pixel, and maybe a few surrounding pixels as well. So the galaxy is effectively that bright pixel in the middle, and maybe some of the light in the neighboring pixels as well. So most of the light from the quasar has been focused, that means I've focused the lens reasonably well, into that one pixel. But what is really incredible about this is that this camera and lens, which are designed for daylight photography, have captured the image of a galaxy that is 25 billion light years away. That's the other side of the observable universe. That is a long, long, long way away. And yet you can catch that light with a camera designed for normal daylight photography. The universe we know is expanding. The further you look, the faster things are receding from us. This galaxy is so far away that it's receding from us at twice the speed of light. That means the light left this galaxy trying to come towards us but the universe was expanding so fast, the light was actually getting dragged backwards. The light is leaving, let's say you, if you're the galaxy, the light is leaving you on the way to my camera, but you are receding so fast, the light gets dragged backwards for billions of years before it finally makes some headway and eventually makes it to the camera. It's the length of time the light has been traveling is 12 billion years or so. In other words, the light has been traveling, not for millions of years, the light has been traveling before arriving at the camera for 90% of the age of the universe. The light left this galaxy when the universe was very, very young, and it's been traveling all that time. The light left this galaxy before the Earth even existed. It had been traveling for 8 billion years, before the Earth even existed. Then the Earth came into being, then life developed, then the dinosaurs came and went, and then finally the light arrived in the camera. The fact that it's possible to do that at all is pretty amazing, and I was very pleased that as a lockdown challenge, it actually was successful. I did look up rather than look down at my feet, and I managed to capture something that is extremely, extremely remote. Let me just finish in the last few minutes with what can be done under the darkest skies of Africa. I've already given you a talk about wildlife photography, so you know I have an interest in wildlife, so if I go to Africa on safari, I'll take a pair of binoculars with me to watch the animals. 
And of course, I'll take a camera because I'm interested in wildlife photography. But I'm also interested in astronomy, and the same set of binoculars will also allow me to see things in the night sky. And the same camera will allow me to do astrophotography as well. And you can do wildlife and astronomy and photography if you go on safari. Not the only way of doing it, but that's a hell of a way of doing it. Basically, you can spend your time looking at animals by day and the stars at night. Basically, sleep when you get home. There's no point in wasting time when you're on holiday. You basically use all the time you can when you're out there. In Africa, you're not guaranteed clear skies, but when you get them, there's always that impetus because you are so far away from any light pollution if you're in the middle of the bush. There's always that temptation to get whatever astrophotography done that you can. And the usual way of doing that with a star tracker is to make sure that you're lined up with your polar scope, you get out your phone, and of course your phone from GPS knows exactly where it is in the world, and it knows exactly what the time is. Therefore, it can tell you that if you're at this place at this time, when you look at the north, if you've got it lined up correctly with the North Pole, Polaris should appear in your little polar scope at that particular position. It calculates where Polaris ought to be if you've got it lined up right. So basically, you simply point this at roughly north, where you think Polaris is, and then you just adjust the tripod until Polaris is sitting at the position that your phone says it ought to. Once you've got that right, you know that it's lined up with the Earth's axis and it should be tracking absolutely perfectly. But that works fine if you can see Polaris. Polaris, remember, is immediately above the North Pole. That if you point the North Pole upwards, you get to the North Celestial Pole, that's where Polaris is. So if your telescope is in England or in any sort of temperate latitudes, that's no problem. Polaris appears to be some jaunty angle high in the sky. But what if you're in Africa, in Kenya or Tanzania, close to the equator? Well, where's the pole then? Well, the pole is on the horizon. So you can't see Polaris because it's hidden behind elephants or trees or mountains or something. So unfortunately, you have a little bit of a problem if you try and use a tracker or indeed any telescope close to the equator because you can't see either pole. They're probably too low down. If you're lucky, they might be a degree or two above the horizon, but the chances are you won't be able to see them. For most of the places I like to visit, Kilimanjaro actually blocks a lot of the aspects, and so you can't necessarily see anything close to the horizon. So you have to find other ways of lining up. In some cases, you just have to guess. But here, um, even with a little bit of guesswork, you can still use a tracker to take some interesting images. This is one of our companion galaxies. Remember when I showed you the picture of Andromeda Galaxy? It had a couple of little companions buzzing around it. That's one of the little companions that's buzzing around the Milky Way. It's called one of the Magellanic Clouds. This one is the large Magellanic Cloud. In a sense, it's a small galaxy in its own right, relatively close to us. It's large enough in the sky that you don't need a huge telephoto lens. 85 millimeter lens is pretty much all you need. Again, a series of one minute exposures. When you are out in the middle of nowhere, the Milky Way can be absolutely spectacular. When you're in the UK, you can often, once you've stepped outside and if you can get away from street lights and if you can let your eyes adapt, you can see the Milky Way going across the sky. But from Africa, it is so much brighter, so much easier to see. Even with the naked eye, you can see all of the intricate structure that's within the Milky Way, all of the dark bands that are crisscrossing the light regions, which are stars much too far away to resolve into individual stars. And of course, the naked eye will allow you to see all of this detail. This is a, a wide angle lens, a 35 millimeter lens view, so a relatively large chunk of sky. Your eyes will pick out all the detail, but of course it'll take a photograph to bring out all the color. Because when the light levels are low, the cones, the color receptors in your eyes simply do not work. They rely on the rods in your eye, which are not color sensitive. So you won't see the color of the Milky Way, but it will come out in the photographs that you take. So as you can possibly see from the corners, this was a mosaic of more than one image because it's a relatively large chunk of sky taken with a 35 millimeter lens. And if you're wondering, the bright interloper there is Jupiter and Saturn is on the left-hand side here. <laughs>
if we compare that with what you would get if you used uh, simply slide film, this is uh, the constellation of Scorpius. This S-shaped constellation here is the constellation of Scorpius that looks a little bit like a scorpion. And we can hardly see the Milky Way running through because photographic film simply did not have the same sensitivity as we're used to with digital photography. Now we've got plenty of sensitivity to see the Milky Way, but there's so many faint stars there, we find it difficult to pick out the bright stars anymore. That constellation of Scorpius is still sitting in there, but it's difficult to see because there's so much other detail. If I point it out to you, you can see that, oh yeah, the constellation of Scorpius is indeed still there, but there's so much faint stuff. Bear in mind that when you look at a very dark sky, it is sometimes very difficult to pick out the constellations because there are so many faint stars that you wouldn't normally see from the skies of England. So that's the same view of the Milky Way. Once you've got the image, you can start looking not only at, OK, there's Jupiter, there's Saturn, but the more you look, the more you can pick out, well, there's a star cluster here, and there's a nebula there. And of course, you've got megapixels in your camera, so if you wish, you can zoom in and to start to see all sorts of details in what's actually going on in there. You can either use a star atlas or you can use an app on your phone. Generally, these are free, that tell you what it is you're looking at. These have all been mapped out in centuries past. Uh, a Frenchman called Messier mapped out all of these objects, hence they're given his names, Messier 1, Messier 2, Messier 3, or for short, M26, M16, M17. M16 is the Eagle Nebula, which has got the Pillars of Creation, which I'm sure you've seen in images from the Hubble Space Telescope, etc. It looks like all the interesting clusters and nebula in the top half, as if nothing interesting is happening uh, in this particular part of the Milky Way. But of course, that's just an artifact. Messier lived in France, and he could only see so far south. He couldn't see over the horizon, as seen from southern France, so he never got to see any of the interesting objects that were in the bottom part of this image. So I guess the takeaway message is you can do an awful lot even with a wide-angle lens, as long as you've got something like a tracker. I was interested thinking, well, that's a nice wide-angle picture, but would it be possible to take a telephoto image of some of these nebula? I happened to think about that before packing away on a rather windy night, thinking, well, if it's a little bit windy, a telephoto lens is going to get a little bit buffeted. Maybe it's not going to be possible. But I did try putting the telephoto lens back on and pointing at this particular pair of nebulae to see if it was possible to catch them. And indeed it was. But I didn't have time to take lots of exposures. So this is a single 30-second image. And it's not even a raw image. It's just a single 30-second JPEG of what you get by sticking the camera on a tracker and taking a picture. You could argue that you don't even need a tracker if it's only a 30-second image. So I definitely picked out the pink of this particular nebula and the pink and blue of this nebula because this has different composition to that one. If we blow that up, we're really pushing our luck a bit to actually expand that any further, but there is definitely structure within the excuse me, within the pink and the blue of this particular nebula called the Triffid Nebula. So most of the time, I'd be happy to take wide-angle pictures and get all of the glorious Milky Way, but it's not ruled out that you could use a telephoto lens to pick out some of the detail in some of these various objects. But if nothing else, I hope I've convinced you that if you're going on holiday to somewhere where you've got dark skies, if you're taking your camera with you anyway, and probably a tripod, why not think about taking a small tracker? You can build one for 25 quid. You can buy one for a couple of hundred quid or less. If they're only a kilogram or so in mass, you can stick it in your luggage. And then when you get to your wonderful dark skies, you can take photographs like the ones I've been showing you. Thank you all for listening.